Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. We have some interesting news that has been shared with me by a number of you guys already uh, that came out a, a few days back and something I really wanted to take and spend a little time with on, and that is that the Ark of Baal, uh, the Babylonian city in Palmyra that was destroyed by ISIS recently, uh, especially the Ark was, it is going to be erected in two major cities, the city of New York, as well as the city of London. It's really caused a major uproar because this ancient uh, Babylonian city uh, or revived Babylonian empire, which you'll later discover tonight as I, we look back in some of the history of this, uh, is, is really synonymous with a lot of wicked and evil um, worship, pagan ideas, uh, sex uh, crimes, and everything else you can imagine. So to have the United States and London as well both erect this city in their countries has really stirred up a lot of debate among uh, people, among scholars, among uh, believers as well. And it also reminds me about how many people have differing opinions on who Babylon really is, especially when it comes to Jeremiah chapter 51. Most uh, Christians hold that this is actually the United States. And there are others that hold that Babylon is the Vatican or the Roman city there. Well, this evening, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into this. And although it is uh, a news broadcast, it is more of an investigative broadcast regarding Babylon and in light of this art uh, being brought into the two cities, a replica, that is, and what the significance may very well mean. So we did a little bit of investigative work on this special broadcast this evening. I was actually hoping to air this on Saturday, Yom Shabbat, that just passed but was unable to get it completed. So we're, we're kind of doing the Monday, our uh, Yom Shabbat message on uh, Yom Rishon, that is uh, the Monday, that is. Uh, or no, Yom Shnei, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get right into this. Babylon has fallen. There are actually three passages of the scripture that speak of Babylon has fallen. All right, let's start doing some tracing here. And by the way, before I get into this, uh, too much. Let me just clarify one little thing here. Uh, it might help make people not get irritated with me right from the very beginning. You're going to discover tonight that Babylon actually does apply both to Rome and as well by extension to the United States and perhaps even the British Empire. So You'll see as we unravel this interesting mystery, but let's find out who those Babylonians really are, especially in modern days. David prophesies of Rome as Esau's descendants, according to Psalm 137, verse 7. Of course, this comes from the very famous ones about uh, at the river of Babylon, where we hear the, the, the beautiful song that has been sung today. It says, Remember, O Lord, the children of Adam, that's Esau's descendants. In the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Now, that is just provocative to say the very least on this, that Adam is actually spoken of by David as Babylon, or in, in, in Psalm verse 8, the daughter of Babylon. All right, now, by the way, those that may not know, most Jewish believers believe that Babylon, and that's rabbis, I say, most Jewish rabbis actually believe that Babylon is, yes, Roman deed, the descendants of Esau, and they also believe, by extension, and as it says in Revelation, the daughter of are the mother of harlots, that, that it does include the United States, and it does include uh, England. So that's kind of interesting. And for a long time, I knew that the, the, many of the rabbis believed that Rome was Esau's descendants, but I did not realize until I was working on this study that they actually saw it the same way that my, I see myself, and that is the United States is, by extension, the daughter of Babylon. So anyway, it says, remember, O Lord, the children of Adam. See, the children of Adam, because they said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation. And yes, in 70 AD, the Romans did indeed destroy the, the temple, 
uh, in Jerusalem and as well as burnt everything down to the ground. And of course, we already know the, the, the story on that, uh, but we'll go into that in just a second here. Obadiah is the one that indicts him on this issue here. Esau's children as accomplices in Jerusalem's destruction. Let's look at that. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 6. How are the things of Esau searched out? See, Esau, Edom. Edom is another name for Esau because his name Esau means red. How are his hidden things sought up? Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Absolutely 100% Obadiah indicts Esau as a co-conspirator, you might call it, or as a, an accomplice to the evils that were happening to Jerusalem. Now, many scholars actually do believe that Titus was not the main culprit, but it was the Syrian army. Now, you're going to find out in a few minutes why the Syrian army was working with Rome. It has a lot to do with the fact that the Roman Empire already had influence over Syria and had conquered Syria. So yes, they did do the soldiers, but Titus did stand, stand by as an accomplice and allowed it to happen. But according to the Ark of Titus, that is right there in Rome, not far from the Vatican, they have this depiction here of carrying the goods from the temple, the temple menorah, the, uh, the shoe, uh, shoe bread box, the horns, etc., back to Rome. Now, there have been some that have claimed that, uh, that those artifacts are, in fact, indeed inside the Vatican uh, catacombs. I know Gershon Solomon has always held to this himself. Now, what, does we, what do we find out in this, uh, as we move along here, let's find out what else we find out. Edom shall be a desolate, uh, shall be, uh, or a desolation. According to Joel chapter 3, verse 19, said, Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be des a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, the house of Judah. Of course, this is what the prophecy speaks of, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So again, Adam or Esau is uh, once again found in the guilt of the blood of uh, the house of Judah. In this case here, in Obadiah, uh, they're, they're found guilty for carrying away their substance. All of this clearly is found to be by the Romans. Titus, the Roman general who came in and took everything away from the Jews, destroyed them, and, and sent them into captivity. That's exactly what happened in 70 AD, and they went to all the world. So according to three witnesses here, Joel, Obadiah, and David, they have all been blamed and prophetically spoken of as those that destroyed the, the, the city and the temple in 70 AD in one fashion or another. Now, also, look at Daniel chapter 9, the prince that shall come, all right? Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, a fourth witness to the same thing says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come. Well, I think that his picture's right there beside it. Whether or not the Pope resigns or not is neither here nor there. Another Pope take his place still makes the same, same difference. That makes no difference whatsoever. But anyway, that prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and the end of the war desolations are determined. Well, the desolations are going to be when Rome becomes destroyed as a result of the evils they did. But also, if you notice, not only does God say uh, that this is going to happen, that the city is going to be destroyed, but it also says that the prince that shall come, that's the Antichrist, will actually come out of the people that destroy the temple and the sanctuary. It's one of Esau's descendants, as we've seen already by three witnesses, David, Obadiah, and Joel, all clearly prophesying 
that it was Esau who would be the one that would destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And clearly history has defined exactly just that. So let's trace Esau's descendants a little bit to see how did Esau end up getting into Rome in the first place? And how, why is there such a, a connection between the Syrians and the, and the children of Esau, or in this case, modern-day Rome? Because, by the way, Rome still has a great affection for the Muslim people or the Arabic peoples around the world. Why is this? Well, they're related is why. If you go back to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 17 through 19, that Hadad fled he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him. Edomites, children of Edom, Esau's descendants. This is during the time when King David's men were warring against Esau's men there, and the scripture says that every one of them were killed. All the men were killed with the exception of Hadad. All right, and anyway, so it says he goes into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which gave him a house, that's Hadad, and appointed him victuals and gave him land. So he, he was given everything. I mean, this boy was really loved for some reason by the Pharaoh. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tophanes, the queen. No doubt, probably a younger sister, either that or he ended up getting an old wife there. This is actually a statue here that's supposedly of Hadad, if I got that right there. Very Interesting indeed, and definitely it's a statue depicts what he looked like. He was not a very nice looking guy either. Anyway, 1 Kings eleven twenty one 21 states, And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab, the captain of his host, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to mine own country. Then Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, thou seekest to go to thine own land? And he answered, nothing, how be it, let me go any wise. Now, this was very peculiar, and it also shows why we see a lot of Egyptian custom and the worship of the sun god and everything else with the Vatican because of their history. Hadad, uh, he goes, and now when he said that he wanted to go to his own country, I was thinking he wanted to go to Mount Seir, where his father's land was at, where God had given them that land. But he doesn't. Watch what it says. It says here in 1 Kings eleven twenty five, 25, And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, beside the mischief that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. So, Hadad actually goes back and becomes the king of Syria. Now we see how it's beginning to go. Hadad, an Edomite, a child of Esau, ends up reigning in Syria. But time moves on down, and let's see what happens as time moves down. Syria becomes the new Babylon, or the revived Babylon. This is on the website, the people that forgot history, or uh, the history forgot, askalum.com, says the two terms became synonymous with Seleucus rule beginning in 312 BCE. And by the way, Hadad was around 970 uh, BC uh, before Christ when he actually went back home because it's believed that David uh, died right around that time frame there. So about 400 years later, four to 500 years later, now we're looking at 312 BCE uh, before the common era is what they use here. It says, in latter times, the kings of the Seleucid Empire consistently call themselves not the kings of Syria, but rather the kings of Babylon. Okay, and the House of the Seleucids, volume 1, page 255, is where they get the information on this. It says, they wanted to maintain the historical tradition of the old Babylonian Empire, that they were its successors, not that they were simply Syrians, and as we presently see, the Seleucid kings represented their realm as a resurrection of the old Babylonian kingdom. So this is where the resurrection of the Babylonian kingdom, kingdom come from. And of course, by this time here, Esau's descendants through Hadad had flourished in this region here. So you had a mixture of the people. They're half uh, Edomites and they're half Syrians or, or Chaldeans. Chaldeans were in the land as well at that time. So there was a lot of mingling in between the peoples there. 
Now, history continues on more forward. According, though, I will say this, according to the Jewish uh, rabbis who have traced the lineage of uh, Esau's descendants, they actually believe, uh, written by some of the sages like Rashi, that Esau's descendants went into northern Africa after uh, Ben-Hadad was, was murdered and the, and the Syrian empire was changed under another lineage rule, but there were still many of the Edomites that were living in Syria, but part of the uh, Edomite kingdom moved into northern Africa, and then they said they later moved into Rome. Now, we know they went into Rome by the prophecy of Obadiah, uh, by the prophecy of Daniel, all of them that show that Esau's descendants ended up in Rome because this is where the attack comes on the house of Judah. That's how we know this happens. But anyway, uh, on History of Syria, nationonline.org, following Alexander's death in 323 BC, control of greater Syria passed to the Seleucids, who ruled the kingdom of Syria from their capital to Damascus for three centuries. In the first centuries AD, Rome rule saw the advent of Christianity in Syria. So you can tell the Edomites were not just going to sit back and watch uh, what they had done years ago in Syria go to waste. They went back and took over the country uh, and began to rule over the Syrians uh, come the first century. And their, their kingdom definitely went by. Of course, here, if you look at 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 7 through 13, this is where we find about Ben-Hadad. He was the last descendant of Esau. I won't take time just to save time to read all of this, but Hazael went to meet uh, Elisha, and we read in here that, uh, that, that, that the king, Ben-Hadad, which means the son of Hadad, uh, it's not, it, I don't think it was Hadad's actual physical son, uh, maybe could have been, but, uh, but it may have been a grandson or something like that. I, I've never quite been able to put that together, but anyway, he is sick, uh, and of course, the prophet says that he will live, but yet he will die. And what it ends up being is that God shows Elisha that Hazael is going to murder Ben-Hadad. And he actually does that. And uh, of course, Hazael was surprised that, 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 that this was going to happen. But uh, Elisha wept over the matter. And of course, Elisha says to uh, Hazael, when he asks, why is he weeping? He says, because I know the evils that you will do to the children uh, of, of the house of Israel. And this is exactly what happens. And then we have the exile that takes place uh, that follows that. Uh, moving on along, the origin of Edom, Babylon, and Rome, or Christianity. This is in Jewish American History Foundation. It says, they, do they not testify in Revelation 17.5? That's what I was mentioning to you a little bit earlier, that uh, even the Jewish people believe that the United States and other kingdoms like uh, Europe and stuff are extensions of Rome. Let me just read to you a quick quote what they say here, and then we're going to go into who Babylon really is today. Do they not testify in Revelation 17.5 that Rome is mystery Babylon, and we cannot confine it to the Roman church? as all Protestants do, saying that she is exclusively Mystery Babylon. For the same chapter and same verses declare that she is the mother of harlots. Who then are her harlot daughters? If she be the mother, most assuredly the whole Christendom, as all ecclesiastical history declares from the Church of England down to her last illegitimate offspring or daughter. Now that's pretty harsh words right there. But as far as the organizational system, I have to agree with them in, in, in part there. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person that was ever a part of these churches was lost or, or going to help as a result. Again, when we do our research, keep in mind, we present things from an objective point of view. It doesn't mean that I agree with every single thing that, that is written there, but I want to show you both sides there. And I just found it interesting that they actually believed that from Revelation 17. And this is something that the Lord had dealt with me on as well, but a little bit more clear. I want to define this out for you just a little bit. So let's take a look at this. United States and Great Britain, daughters of Babylon by extension is what I put here. Notice in the prophecy of Zechariah, verse, chapter 2, verse 7 says, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. Now, the daughter of Babylon, as I said, 
is more referring by extension someone other than Mystery Babylon. And like the rabbis are saying, it, the Mystery Babylon was a mother and had harlots for daughters. Now, they believe that that is just the Protestant churches, all right? Well, to me, it's more of an individual situation, but yes, there are some of those Protestant churches. I can't say all of them, but they may, who knows what's going to happen before it's all over with. But like the Lutherans, uh, I believe the Presbyterians, many of these churches, even in the evangelical circles, individual churches, I should say, I don't want to put them all up together as a denomination, but I know the Lutherans are going back in as well. They're all joining back up with their mother, but it wasn't just churches, friends. The Catholic Church is the mother of the Islamic faith as well. So it's not just churches, it's even the Islamic faith, but you see that Islam, the Sunnis, have joined back in with Rome as well. Uh, so you can't, I can't call kettle black, so to speak. All right, now watch this here. God says to Zion, that's the Jewish people, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon, deliver yourself. In other words, get out of there. You need to go back home to Israel. All right, God wants you out of this stuff. And not just the fact that you're in the nation, but get out of, get also out of those churches. If you're Jewish, get out of it. My gosh. What does it say in Revelation 18, 4? Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. That's a strong statement there, but that's one people need to wake up and recognize what it states. All right. Now watch this, in Jeremiah 51, verse 4 and 5, here's your daughter of Babylon, thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. What, what does this mean by the Chaldeans? Well, remember the Chaldeans, and I don't know if I had any of this information in here for you, but the Chaldeans were in Syria, and Hadad, when he went there, his people, his descendants mixed with the Syrian people, and it was a melting pot of nations in Babylon, just like it is in the United States today. There are all kinds of nations down there, including the Chaldeans. So when Hadad's people spread and then end up in Rome and then end up in London, or and by the way, London right now, and I didn't know this until I was actually leaving. My son told me this because he loves to study history. There is a a, a part of the Babylonian Empire encompassed in Rome, Rome, and there is still the wall, the Babylonian wall there in London. I mean, these things are just fascinating, friends, to find out all these things. But then again, it extended not just from London, but goes across the sea. Why? Because that's where her daughters went. That's where all the denominational systems got started. And even the Muslims went there as well. So watch what it says. <clears throat> Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they are thrust through in her streets. Notice they're thrust through. That means they're being stabbed to death. That's a lot like what's going on in Israel right now. Remember I shared with you not long ago that what's happening in Israel is a prophecy in itself. Because what does the scripture say, and, and, and I don't have this on here, but Ezekiel chapter 35, that they would be thrust through. But, or no, he would, he would thrust them through with the sword in the time of their calamity, and also at the time that their sin had an end. And again, Esau is to blame for it. And that's exactly what happened. By the sword, the Edomites, through Rome, Titus, the Roman general, came down and thrust through the children of Israel in their land in 70 AD. But it also said at the time that their iniquity would have an end. That's in modern days today. And what have they been doing with the third intifada? Taking the sword and stabbing all the Israelis, thrusting them through. Brother, if you don't recognize prophecy being fulfilled in that, I don't know what to tell you. See, God is not mocked. Yeshua was thrust through. By who? The Romans. It's always been Rome that's behind it. It's not the Palestinians so much. It's Rome inciting the violence against the Jews. To do what? To thrust them through. But of course, the Palestinians, who are Jordanians and Syrians, who are what? Edomites also, by descent from the Romans even, through, because they intermingled. And it was it not the very uh, cardinal Jean Theron 
Back in 2011, Guli Miyadi, I've mentioned it many times to you, that actually said there will be no peace in Jerusalem until the holy sites are, are answered, until we get all of the old city. So yes, Ezekiel 35, they've thrown them back to the sword. Thrust through, just like the Romans thrust through Christ. Oh, Esau's always been guilty. Jeremiah 50, by the way, that's a compound fulfillment when it says their iniquity had an end. That was referring when Yeshua died on that cross and he was thrust through by Adam. And it's also referring to the day we're living in now when the Jews are being thrust through in their backs and in their chest and everything else, just like Yeshua was. See, when they thrust him through, they drove that spear right into his heart. What are the Palestinians doing today? Driving it into their heart. 51.5, for Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, even though it looks like it, okay? Or the Lord of hosts through their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Oh my gosh, friends. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. You see that? In other words, the Jews today are still against Yeshua to be the Mashiach. Not all of them. Let me tell you something, friend. There's a many of Israelis that watch this broadcast right here. Many of them have said to me, Steve, we're ready for the Mashiach, but we will not accept a Vatican Mashiach. God bless them for that. Amen. On April the 20th, excuse me, in April 2016, the Temple of Baal will be erected in Times Square in New York City. This was one of the articles, the most important news, March 22nd, 2016, that brought this article out. I realize that the headline of this article sounds like it must be false, but it is actually completely true. The Temple of Baal, also known as the Temple of Baal, was a world-famous landmark that was located in Palmyra, Syria. In August of 2015, this temple was destroyed by ISIS and most of the world recoiled in terror at the loss of a cultural heritage site. In any attempt to preserve history to, ex to exact replica, excuse me, two exact replicas of the 50-foot arch that stood in the entrance of the temple will be erected in April 2016 in Times Square in New York City and the Trafalgar Square in London. Needless to say, a lot of people are quite disturbed by this. In ancient times, child sacrifice and bisexual orgies were common practices at the altars of Baal, and now we are putting up, up on a monument of worship to this false god in the heart of our most important city. You don't think these things are not repeating today? You don't think that America, that they still don't offer up babies as sacrifices? Sure they do. Every child they kill in the womb is, is a sacrifice unto Baal. You don't think they ain't still doing it? Sure they are. And the other day, and I'm, I don't care about the politics, I think they're all corrupt to begin with, but you know, there's one thing I saw that um, uh, Donald Trump, I always wonder if his name Trump doesn't have a significance for the sounding of the trumpet at this time, but I don't say he's a... Christian, where I, you know, I'm not saying that, but when that man took a stand and said that doctors ought to be held and the people that practice in there ought to be held accountable for what they're doing, I agree with him. It should be overturned. And it's nothing against the women. I say that 100%. It's nothing against them. Many of them forced into a bad situation. Many of them grieve in their hearts for what has happened in their life. God have mercy on them, and I pray for you sisters that have ever had to endure this. I did a video, an in-depth video on this one time, just showing the mercy of God that He loves you and that He knows whatever you went through, and maybe willfully, but don't think that God won't forgive. He will forgive. But a nation that would just allow senseless murder is different. They're the ones that are guilty of the altar to Baal. Not, not you, my precious sisters, and maybe not even a sister as of yet, but have made these mistakes or, or did something like that. That's not you. That's those wicked priests in their little white uniforms running around that did that. So yes, 
Babylon, the daughter of Babylon by extension, is the United States. The nations have drunken of her wine. Jeremiah 51, 7. Watch this. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Jeremiah 51, 13. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant and treasures, thine end is come, and the measure of thy covetousness. Now, some people say, well, that's America because they're all over the world and every nation and stuff. No. That's only by extension. The Vatican has all of its churches on many waters. But there are certain elements that are going to be destroyed. That doesn't mean that South America will be destroyed necessarily. But he's going to hit those main daughters that have fed the world all their lives. King David's tomb, the room conquered by the church. This was an article on Israel National News on June the 9th of 2014. That was the title of the article, King David's tomb room conquered by the church. In further proof of the fixed nature of Christian mass services being imposed on David's tomb compound, services which were filmed on Sunday, it now turns out that mass was held again on Monday morning, this time in the very room where King David's tomb is said to be located. The very next day. Pope does it on Sunday. The next day they come in there and they do it again. Rabbinite Yochaved uh, Grossman, a lead activist for King David's tomb, reported to Arut Shiva that numerous priests and monks held mass services in the room of King David's grave marker. They threw him out. Friends, they threw them out. Do you not realize the scriptures that are being fulfilled with this? Look at this here. Prophecy fulfilling. I wrote this in here. Obadiah 1.6 For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually, or all the nations, or all the Gentiles. What did it say in Revelations? For they have drunk, they have, all the nations have drunken from the cup of her fornication. That's another scripture was fulfilled right here in 2014 during the Passover that they did on, oh, excuse me, it was during their Sunday worship. Let me get that straight there. So, and by the way, forgive me for doing that message on Sunday. I always said any day is a great day to talk about Yeshua, but I don't want to cause a stumbling block. I know that the Easter that they celebrate is definitely not the resurrection of Yeshua. All right, but anyway, Pope did his own mass there, and the next day they did another one. How do we know this is scripture fulfilled? If you look at this in the Hebrew, which I don't have it up here for you, when it says the Shutatecha, they, they would drink, but it's in the masculine plural on the first one, showing it was men only. But then it's in the gender inclusive plural of all the Gentiles, which is what happened the next day. Because the first day it was only men amongst the delegation of the Pope in there that partook of their mass service. The following day, it was a mixed congregation. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. So it's going to change, friends. And by the way, I put this picture up here for you so you can see. They were, the police were dragging the Jews out. This is King David's tomb. Been there many, many times. They're dragging them out forcibly, the Orthodox Jews, so that Rome can have their mass in King David's tomb. What a disgrace. Anyway, I want to point something out to you here. It's kind of interesting. In three places in the scripture, as I said at the beginning, Babylon has fallen is noted three different times. Isaiah 21, 9. Behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon has fallen, is fallen. And the graven images of her gods, he hath broken unto the ground. It's ancient Babylon. Yes, it happened. Revelation 14, 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Notice that great city. Singular. Okay? Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. All right? Keep that in mind. Don't forget, 
that great city is fallen. One city, all right? Now, let's look at Jeremiah 51, 3. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her yet a little while, and the time of her harvest shall come. Daughter of Babylon, all right? Not mystery Babylon, not the, uh, okay, watch. Now, Jeremiah 51, going down to verse 42. The sea has come upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of waves thereof. How many of you believers out there have had dreams of massive tidal waves that will hit the United States? Here's your daughter of Babylon. My wife as well said they were so high. <laughs> it's just unbelievable, unfathomable how big these waves are that are going to hit the U.S. Verse 43 says, Her cities are a desolation. Not city. Not like what we have here in Revelation 14.8. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That great city, singular. All right, that's Rome. But over here in Jeremiah 51, 43, her cities, plural, are a desolation, a dry land and a wilderness and a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass thereby. There's the daughter of Babylon by extension. All right, Revelation 17, 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's a city. Mystery Babylon is a city. Rome. Her daughters. See, mother of harlots. Well, what's the harlot then? She's the daughter of the mother. And no wonder why people say the United States is Jeremiah 51. Sure it is. Look at all these nice people here. Tony Palmer got this going for the Pope here. Got Kenneth Copeland and his whole evangelical group to come right back into Mother Rome. They're back there with Mama. Do you know that even they even use that terminology? They're coming home to their mother? How much more plain do we need to get, friends? How much more plain do we need to get? So those two arches in London and New York, are a sign to the world that the daughter of Babylon will soon fall. Her time of her threshing is at hand. Even what Isis did to this Babylonian arch in Palmyra was a sign that the destruction of Babylon is soon at hand. If you've ever repented, if you've ever recognized Yeshua as your own Savior, this is that time. That time is very short. My Jewish brethren, come out of her. My Christian friends, come out of her. They have deceived the world. And now, do you think I trust all these men that are taking up for the Vatican right now? There ain't no way. There is no way. They suck up to Rome like you never would believe. People I never thought would stand for Rome are doing it. She is Mystery Babylon. No wonder why they do it. They're the daughters. They have no other place to go. But the true believers will stand for the God of Israel. They will believe her Messiah, Yeshua. I'm Stephen Benoon. Special report on Babylon. With Israel News Live. Shalom.